your Bibles and turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to get a reading in verse 1. We're going to read down through verse 5 of Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 beginning in verse 1. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Odicus, and I beseech Syntyche, that ye be in the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true young fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with others my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known to all men, the Lord. Father, I thank you for this day you've given. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for the opportunity we have to consider the truths that are found in this passage, Lord. This evening. Pray you speak to us, Lord. Use your word in our heart. I pray you bless us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the themes that is resounded throughout the book of Philippians is the theme of unity. He has approached it from several different angles. He's hit it several different ways. Mostly with an indirect approach. Now he comes very direct and very straight. Chapter 4 begins with a series of exhortations, one of which directly involves a problem. The rest of it is, in fact, um, Exhortations that, if they're heeded, would greatly promote unity in the church. Here are some of the exhortations that are found. And if you would really look at the context, all of this would be preached together, but I'm not going to do that because I would be going from verse 1 down through about 9 or 10, and that's two or three messages for sure. He tells us to be steadfast in the Lord, forbearance toward others and enjoying it. Effective prayer life is talked about. Controlled thought life is spoken about. All of these contribute to unity. There are, in fact, four commands, four exhortations I want to look at today in this whole issue of dealing with disunity. The first exhortation I'd like to look at is found in verse 1. He says, be steadfast. In the Lord. In verse 1 he says, Wherefore, my beloved brother, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. The therefore, whenever you see a therefore in the Word of God, the little saying that we always say, is when there's a therefore, you have to go see what it's there for. So you need to go look and see what it's talking about, and what that therefore is pointing back to is the verses right before it in the end of chapter 3. The end of chapter 3 it says, uh, for our conversation is in heaven, for whence also we look for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who should change our vile body, that will be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to do things, all things unto himself. So what really he is saying is he's saying this, is therefore points back to this talking of heavenly citizenship, the promise of Christ's soon return. So I'm going to paraphrase what I think he's really saying. I think what he's really saying is bearing in mind your citizenship in heaven. And the hope of the coming Savior, you need to stand firm in the Lord. The challenge here, in light of this whole idea of disunity, I think it was what he's saying is don't look at other people. Don't look at other people around you because there are going to be people who are going to fail you. There's going to be people who are not doing what they should be doing. Keep your eyes on the Lord because it's in fact the Lord who we need to be watching. It's the Lord who we need to be standing firm for. Look at God and remain faithful to Him. There were probably people within this church who were looking at these two individuals, these two ladies, Odicus and Syntyche, who seemed to have been rather well known. Possibly taking sides. Possibly deciding which one was right and which one was wrong. And the Apostle Paul is challenging them 
Don't be looking at them. Don't be watching them. Stand firm in the Lord. Stay right with God. Keep your position with the Lord right. Stand fast. Be steadfast. Don't look around. Don't look behind. Stay right. Not only is the challenge in this passage to be steadfast in the Lord, the second challenge that's given in this whole idea of dealing with disunity, not only is he saying stop looking at other people, you're looking at God. The second one he's saying is very clearly, he says, deal with your disunity. Look at verses 2 and 3. It says, I beseech Odicus and I beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true young fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with others, other, my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Two apparently prominent women in the Philippian church, Odicus and Syntyche, have become, as one commentator stated it, odious and soon stinky <laughs> because of their disagreement and we don't know what it's about we don't know what this was about we don't know which one was right and which one was wrong and by the way i want you to notice the apostle paul doesn't seem to care which one was right and which one was wrong he says the issue needs to be dealt with it needs to be taken care of he says in the challenge that's given here i beseech Odicus and beseech that they be of the same mind in the Lord. See, we don't know what caused the conflict. But we do know that these two apparently sweet-tempered Christian women, if their names mean anything, because one's name, Odicus, meant sweet fragrance. And Syntyche meant fortunate or affable. So if their names meant anything at all, these normally sweet tempered Christian women had somehow gotten crosswise against each other. Something had happened. Sadly, they had allowed this personal difference to become a church issue. And this problem had disrupted the unity of the entire church to the point that the Apostle Paul found out about this all the way in the city of Rome. This was not next door. This wasn't even a town won over. Rome was hundreds of miles away. Travel wasn't real easy. Texting wasn't an issue. And Facebook wasn't even there. Nowadays, we always know when there's an issue because it's on Facebook. Oh, no, no, I get, you know, every people have to post their entire life. You ever notice that? You know, I ate a banana today. <laughs> it wasn't good. You know, it's all kind of, I'm amazed. I, I just, I mean, I, I guess I'm from the other era. <laughs> but anyway. Somehow, he had found out about this hundreds of miles away. Very possibly when one of the couriers went to talk to him and to bear the gift that had gone there, we know Epaphroditus had made the trip there a, a period of months before very possibly this issue had been going on even back then. And he bore with them that message and said, guess what? We've got some issues brewing. We've got some ladies who just can't get along. The problem became large enough and big enough that in all reality, I looked at the book of Philippians and I tried to find another reason the letter was written. And short of him thanking them for the gift that they sent, there isn't one. Now you look at the Galatian epistle. It was written because they were messed up in, you know, legalism. The Colossian letter was because they were in pre-Gnostic Gnosticism. They were all going off into, you know, carnal, all kinds of strange doctrinal positions. You read the book of. First Corinthians, you've got a hundred thousand reasons why they wrote the letters. There's many, many reasons because those guys were messed up. But if you read the book of Philippians, and if you didn't write the letter and send the courier halfway across the known world at that day about this issue of these two ladies, there wasn't really another reason. Unity is talked about throughout the book several times. 
And finally, as he's hinted to it many, many times, he now takes the bulls by the horns and says, you two ladies, stop it! I don't know what's going on. I don't care what's going on. Be of the same mind in the Lord. The solution to strife is to submit your attitude to the Lord. Paul was apparently impartial with assigning responsibility. You don't see him saying, and by the way, Sindiki, I agree with Odius. Or by the way, I agree with this one. He doesn't do that. Apparently, it didn't seem to matter to him. Each lady needed to change her way of thinking. The problem had arisen because each one was doing her own thinking and was really primarily thinking about herself. And as a result of it, they were not having the mind of Christ. See, the fact that it is, the solution to strife is to submit our attitude to Christ. That's one truth we need to see. When there's issues in churches and issues to arise, when there's strife among people, the way to solve it is for each one of us to submit our attitude to Christ. Look at the end of the verse, chapter 2. He says in verse uh, 2, the end of the verse, be of the, uh, I beseech Odicus, I beseech Sidney, be of the same mind in the Lord. He says, I want you to think the same things in the Lord. He says, you need to be thinking the way God wants you to be thinking. You need to get your mind right. You need to get your thinking straight, you need to stop thinking about yourself and start thinking about God and start thinking about His work and the effect that all this will have on His work. Another truth I want us to notice is the solution of strife sometimes requires peace. Look at verse 3. It says, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with others, my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. These two ladies apparently needed someone to help them out, help them to settle their difficulty. Paul called upon one of the Philippian believers to be that person. The word that she used here is true yoke fellow. Now, the, uh, is this the name of this individual or who this individual was? No one surely knows. Someone has suggested that very possibly he was talking about Epaphroditus. He was making his trip back with this letter, and very possibly that some people say that's who it was referring to. I personally don't believe that. I actually believe True Yoke Fellow was actually a, a, an actual uh, personal name. The name is actually Sisychus. Sisychus is actually a name, and that's the meaning of that name, True Yoke Fellow. I believe this is an individual. He calls out my name and says, you, Sisychus, help them when they get there. Help them get this thing straightened out. Help them deal with this problem. The word help there literally means to take hold of together with them. It really suggests the idea that both of these women had really wanted to deal with the problem already. But that neither one wanted to make the first move. That this one wanted to get right with this one over here. But she didn't want to be first. And this one didn't want to be first. And, and as a result of it, nobody moved. And you know what? That's often the case. People know that they've got to deal with things. They know something's wrong. They know that God wants them to deal with it, but nobody wants to be the one to submit first and say, I'm sorry. I was wrong. And this particular individual, the Apostle Paul, calls on the case of this guy named Sisychus, or a person named Sisychus, whoever that would be, and asks them to, in fact, take the first step to help them to attack the problem together instead of attacking each other. Paul has a sincere concern about the situation in the church. He understood what this unity would do. He's attacked it in many cases in many other churches. He attacked it in the, the letter to the first Corinthians. He's attacked it in other places also because he understands and realizes what this unity will cause. A church that's united goes forth as one. A church that's divided doesn't accomplish anything because they are spending too much of their time fighting with each other, battling with each other, and taking sides 
on each other. Oh, I think this was right. No, I think this was right. No, 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 no. You didn't know. You didn't see what really happened. I know what really happened. You know, you weren't there. Well, I don't really care. But I was there. You know, it just takes people and moves them from the position of doing anything for God spending all their time dealing with an issue that they're not really going to deal with. The challenge here in this passage is to be, first of all, steadfast. It says, don't allow the problems that others have. Don't allow the issues that are going on around you to get you off of focus. Be steadfast. And he says to those who are in the, involved in the midst of this unity, be in the same mind in the Lord. He's saying, stop thinking about yourself. It points back, by the way, to Philippians chapter 2. Because in Philippians chapter 2, he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery, be equal of God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of sinful men. And being found in fashion of man, he made a humble himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him, and giving him a name which is above every name, and in the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, of things in earth, and things under the earth. He says, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Now, think with me for a moment. Did Christ think about himself when he came to the earth? No. If he thought about what was good for him, he just said to God, oh, I'm going to pass on this. I'm going to stay here. I, I kind of like the glory. I kind of like heaven. The angels are great. I don't really want to go to the earth, and I definitely don't want to die. I'm going to stay here. But he didn't think about it. He didn't think about himself and what he wanted to accomplish. He thought about man and what man needed. We need to get our eyes off ourselves at times and get our eyes back on God and realize what God wants us to do in our lives. What we, what we need to do in certain situations. One of the biggest reasons why disunity often reigns in churches is because people can't get their eyes off themselves and off of the, well, the little, the whatever that was, they, they offended me. How dare they say that? Did you, did you hear that? Did you hear what they said to me? The biggest church issues start with some of the smallest, dumbest, littlest things. And by the time it's done, sometimes churches are totally destroyed, and some churches never get over the situation, the problem that happens as a result. There have been churches totally destroyed. I know of a church that totally destroyed and disbanded over what color they were going to make when they put the new car in the yard. Pastor wanted blue, one of the deacons wanted red, and there was a church split over blue and red. Make it green! Who cares what color it is? Does it even really matter? I don't really, I'm not sure, but I have never seen anywhere in the scripture where it says carpets have to be red. Now, my home church had red carpets too, but does it have to be red? No personal preferences shouldn't ever become church issues. And somebody's little faux pas or some little problem they had should never become disruptive to the unity of a local church. He tells us, first of all, the steadfast in the Lord. He says, that can be healed with your disunity. But the next thing he puts in there, the next command that he puts in and groups together, and I do believe these go together. I believe in context. I believe when we read scripture, we need to pay attention to context. And the next verse that used here doesn't really seem to fit in our mind. Look what it says. Uh, rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. The next exhortation he gives. In light of this whole situation of disunity, he says, you know what? You need to be always rejoicing. You need to be always thankful. You need to be always rejoicing in the Lord. This verse.
verse presents a somewhat astonishing command to continually be rejoicing in the Lord. Joy is something that we can, you know, we think we can encourage it, but how can we command joy? But God commands it. He says, be rejoicing. Be joyous. Believers that have a holy obligation to live lives that are filled with joy. I remember seeing a Charlie Brown cartoon where it said, happiness is a one pot. But you know what? Though happiness may be a warm pup, puppies are cute and they're nice. And by the way, do not tell me kids we're getting a pup. Very good idea. Now, circumstances do not determine our joy, our least issues. We can continue to rejoice in spite of our circumstances. That's why the command is to rejoice always. No circumstance of life, whether poverty, illness, persecution, or death, or disunity, can rob us of our joy. Paul himself was filled with joy in spite of the flogging he'd taken in Acts chapter 16. And in spite of the fetters with the chain, even as he wrote this letter in uh, verse 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 7, he's chained and fettered as he writes this letter. And even in the midst of this, <laughs> even in the midst of this, he has joy. The command is to be joyous. So how do we have unity? He always says, first of all, he said, you know, what, what is the way of dealing with this unity? He says, first of all, he's dead back. And he'll stop looking at everything else. Get your eyes on God. Look at him. Follow him. He's coming back. Your citizenship is in heaven. The Lord is coming back for you. Stand firm in the Lord. The second thing he says is deal with disunity. Take care of the issue that's there. Take whatever necessary steps are need to be done. And by the way, I don't know if you've ever paid attention to it. Matthew 18, it says, if you have a, city, you have a problem with someone else, you're to go to them. In Matthew, chap in Matthew chapter 5, it says, if someone has a problem with you, you're to go to them. The idea is both are supposed to be approaching the other to deal with the problem that's there. I kind of get the idea that you're supposed to be heading together and whoop, you meet in the middle. And say, you know what? I'm sorry. Let's deal with it. How important, by the way, is it getting things right before God? God says in Matthew chapter 5, if you come to offer your gift at the altar, and remember there that your brother has audience against you, he says, leave there my gift before the altar. That means, by the way, ungiven. He says, leave it there. Don't give it. Set it down and go. Deal with your problem. Then come back and give it. It's more important than our giving to God. It's more important than our apparent service for God. It's, the most, it's one of the most important things that we can do is deal with this unity in the church. He says, also, we are to be always rejoicing. And the last thing I'd like us to notice is found in verse 5, the last exhortation I'm going to state it the way it's stated in the King James, and then I'm going to explain to you what it really means. It says in verse 5, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is, is at hand. He tells us to always be moderate or gentle. You probably have a little key on your thing. It says gentleness behind it. More than likely you do. This third quality of Christian character is called moderation. It's called gentleness. It really refers to what it really the word really means. It means a willingness to yield one's own preference in favor of one's reasonable desires of another. In other words, it basically says, I'm willing to give up something to be able to get along with you. So how does that actually fit as far as disunity? Well, I can see how that fits as far as disunity. It's saying, I'm not going to push what I'm pushing. I'm not going to worry about always being right. I'm not going to worry about always having my way. Now, let's not talk about doctrine, because by the way, doctrine is not something you fudge on. You don't give up doctrine for the sake of unity. You don't give up holiness for the sake of unity. But we can give up peanut butter versus butter. We can give up, though I will say, I do love peanut butter. And I love butter, too. But, you know, 
What he's saying is, there are some things that we can be willing to fudge, willing to give up, willing to yield on. This whole idea of moderation or gentleness is a willingness to yield one's own preference in favor of someone else's. He says, let your moderation be known unto all men. Our gentleness should be obvious to everyone to whom we have contact. We should never wear thin in a relationship with others because we push our own desires to the table. He says, be an easy person to deal with. Be a person who's easy to get along. The arm sent up for this, he says, why should we do this? Why should I be willing to yield my preference? But I like it better. I like that. I don't care if you like it. Why does he say I should be willing to yield? He says the Lord is a man. Seeing God is coming back. Jesus is coming back. And he wants. He's going to be here. We better work to make the change. The challenge here in this passage, I looked at four. There's a whole list of exhortations, and really they all go together. But I can't preach that short. I'd be here for a long, long time. We'll finish the rest of them next week and the weeks that follow. The first one is to be steadfast. Don't get your eyes on God. Keep your eyes on Him. Stop looking at everyone else. Keep your eyes on Him and stay steadfast. Remain in faith. Deal with the disunity that, 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 that is in our way. Take care of the situation. He says, be at the same bottom in the world. Don't let problems around you get in the way of your joy. Happiness may be a warm puppy. A true happiness, true joy, is Jesus in the heart and a right relationship. Last, he says, be a little bit willing to you. Don't have to push your way all the time. Be a person who's easy to get along. Now, there are times that we take those to the nth degree and we say, well, I'm not going to be willing to milk those or whatever. And that's not what it's talking about. But it's talking about somebody who has, doesn't have to fight all the time over dumb things. Over things that don't make a difference. Church fights have happened over some of the stupidest things. I don't even want to talk about some of the ones that I've seen and heard over the years. Because some of them are even worse than the red and, the other, the red and blue carpet. Those were, that's a good one compared to some of the others I've seen and heard of. We need to be people who are easy to get along with. In light of the fact that Christ is Father, I thank you for this day you've given to us. I thank you for the way you've worked in our lives. I pray you'd help us, Lord, to in fact deal with this unity and maintain the unity within our church. That we get our eyes off of each other, get our eyes on you. That when you, this unity does spring up, that we would get the same mind and deal with those things. And we would in fact rejoice us. That would be easy. I pray you'd be with us and bless and all time. Help us to honor you in everything we do. And I pray you to bless in Jesus' name. Take your hymn book if you would just for a moment and sing one last song. I